From La Morte d'Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory Then were they condescended that King Arthur and Sir Mordred should meet betwixt both their hosts, and every each of them should bring fourteen persons. And they came with this word unto Arthur. Then said he, I am glad that this is done. And so he went into the field. And when Arthur should depart, he warned all his host that and they see any sword drawn, look ye come on fiercely, and slay that traitor Sir Mordred, for I in no wise trust him. In likewise Sir Mordred warned his host that, and ye see any sword drawn, look that ye come on fiercely, and so slay all that ever before you standeth, for in no wise I will not trust for this treaty, for I know well my father will be avenged on me. And so they met as their appointment was, and so they were agreed and accorded thoroughly, and wine was fetched, and they drank. Right soon came an adder out of a little heath-bush, and it stung a knight on the foot. And when the knight felt him stungen, he looked down and saw the adder, and then drew his sword to slay the adder, and thought of none other harm. And when the host on both parties saw that sword drawn, then they blew beams, trumpets and horns, and shouted grimly. And so both hosts dressed them together. And King Arthur took his horse and said, Alas, this unhappy day, and so rode to his party, and Sir Mordred in likewise, and never was there seen a more doleful a battle in no Christian land, for there was but rushing and riding, foining and striking, and many a grim word was there spoken either to other, and many a deadly stroke. But ever King Arthur rode throughout the battle of Sir Mordred many times, and full nobly, as a noble king should. And at all times he fainted never. And Sir Mordred that day put him in devoir and in great peril. And thus they fought all the day long, and never stinted, till the noble knights were laid to the cold earth, and ever they fought still till it was near night. And by that time there was an hundred thousand laid dead upon the down. Then was Arthur wroth out of measure when he saw his people so slain from him. Then the king looked about him, and then he was where of all his host and of all his good knights were left no more alive but two knights, that one was Sir Lucan the butler and his brother Sir Bedivere. And they were full sore wounded. Jeez, you mercy, said the king, where are all my noble knights becomen? Alas, that ever I should see this doleful day. For now, said Arthur, I am come to mine end. But would to God that I wist where were that traitor Sir Mordred that hath caused all this mischief. Then was King Arthur where, where Sir Mordred leaned upon his sword, among a great heap of dead men. Now give me my spear, said Arthur unto Sir Lucan, for yonder I have espied the traitor that all this woe hath wrought. Sir, let him be, said Sir Lucan, for he is unhappy, and if ye pass this unhappy day, ye shall be right well revenged upon him. 
Good Lord, remember ye of your night's dream, and what the spirit of Gawain told you this night. Yet God of his great goodness hath preserved you hitherto. Therefore, for God's sake, my Lord, leave off by this. For blessed be God, ye have won the field. For here we be three alive, and with Sir Mordred is none alive. And if ye leave off now, this wicked day of destiny is past. Tide me death, betide me life, said the king. Now I see him yonder alone. He shall never escape mine hands, for at a better avail shall I never have him. God speed you well, said Sir Bedivere. Then the king gat his spear in both his hands, and ran towards Sir Mordred, crying, Traitor, now is thy death day come. And when Sir Mordred heard King Arthur, he ran until him with his sword drawn in his hand. And there King Arthur smote Sir Mordred under the shield, with a foin of his spear throughout the body more than a fathom. And when Sir Mordred felt that he had his death's wound, he thrust himself with the might that he had up to the burr of King Arthur's spear. And right so he smote his father Arthur, with his sword holding in both his hands, on the side of the head, that the sword pierced the helmet and the brain pan. And therewithal Sir Mordred fell, stark dead to the earth. And the noble Arthur fell in a swoon to the earth, and there he swooned oft times. And Sir Lucan the butler and Sir Bedivere oft times heave him up. And so weakly they led him betwixt them both to a little chapel not far from the seaside. And when the king was there, he thought him well eased. Then heard they people cry in the field. Now go thou, Sir Lucan, said the king, and do me to wit what betokens that noise in the field. So Sir Lucan departed, for he was grievously wounded in many places. And so as he yeed, he saw and hearkened by the moonlight how that pillars and robbers were coming into the field to pill and to rob many a full noble knight of brooches and beads, of many a good ring and of many a rich jewel. And who that were not dead all out, there they slew them for their harness and their riches. When Sir Lucan understood this work, he came to the king as soon as he might, and told him all what he had heard and seen. Therefore, by my rede, said Sir Lucan, it is best that we bring you to some town. I would it were so, said the king, but I may not stand, mine head works so. Ah, Sir Lancelot, said King Arthur, this day have I sore missed thee. Alas, that ever I was against thee, for now I have my death, whereof Sir Gawain warned me in my dream. Then Sir Lucan took up the king the one part, and Sir Bedivere the other part, and in the lifting the king swooned, and Sir Lucan fell in a swoon with the lift, that the part of his guts fell out of his body. And therewith the noble knight's heart brast. And when the king awoke, he beheld Sir Lucan, how he lay foaming at the mouth, and part of his guts lay at his feet. Alas, said the king, this is to me a full heavy sight, to see this noble duke so die for my sake, for he would have holpen me that had more need of help than I. Alas, 
he would not complain him. His heart was so set to help me. Now, Jesu, have mercy upon his soul. Then Sir Bedivere wept for the death of his brother. Leave this mourning and weeping, said the king, for all this will not avail me. For wit thou well, and I might live myself, the death of Sir Lucan would grieve me evermore. But my time hieth fast, said the king. Therefore, said Arthur unto Sir Bedivere, take thou Excalibur, my good sword, and go with it to yonder waterside, and when thou comest there, I charge thee, throw my sword in that water, and come again, and tell me what thou seest. My lord, said Sir Bedivere, your commandment shall be done, and lightly bring you word again. So Sir Bedivere departed, and by the way he beheld that noble sword, that the pommel and the haft was all of precious stones. And then he said to himself, If I throw this rich sword in the water, thereof shall never come good, but harm and loss. And then Sir Bedivere hid Excalibur under a tree. And so, as soon as he might, he came again unto the king, and said he had been at the water, and had thrown the sword into the water. What sawest thou there? said the king. Sir, he said, I saw nothing but waves and winds. That is untruly said of thee, said the king, therefore go thou lightly again, and do my commandment, as thou art leave to me and dear, spare not, but throw it in. Then Sir Bedivere returned again, and took the sword in his hand, and then him thought sin and shame to throw away that noble sword. And so eft he hid the sword, and returned again, and told to the king that he had been at the water, and done his commandment. What sawest thou there? said the king. Sir, he said, I saw nothing but the waters wap, and the waves won. Ah, traitor untrue, said King Arthur, now thou hast betrayed me twice. Who would have weaned that thou that hast been to me so leave and dear, and thou art named a noble knight, and would betray me for the riches of the sword? But now go again lightly, for thy long tarrying putteth me in great jeopardy of my life, for I have taken cold. And but if thou do not now as I bid thee, if ever I may see thee, I shall slay thee mine own hands, for thou wouldst for my rich sword see me dead. Then Sir Bedivere departed, and went to the sword, and lightly took it up, and went to the waterside. And there he bound the girdle about the hilts, and then he threw the sword as far into the water as he might. And there came an arm and a hand above the water, and met it, and caught it, and so shook it thrice and brandished, and then vanished away the sword in the water. So Sir Bedivere came again unto the king, and told him what he saw. Alas, said the king, help me hence, for I dread me, I have tarried over long. Then Sir Bedivere took the king upon his back, and so went with him to the waterside. And when they were at the waterside, even fast by the bank, hoved a little barge with many fair ladies in it, and among them all was a queen, and all they had black hoods, and they all wept and shrieked when they saw King Arthur. Now put me into the barge, 
said the king. And he did so softly. And there received him three queens with great mourning. And so they set him down. And in one of their laps, King Arthur laid his head. And then that queen said, Ah, dear brother, why have ye tarried so long from me? Alas, this wound on your head hath caught over much cold. And so they rode from the land, and Sir Bedivere beheld all those ladies go from him. Then Sir Bedivere cried, Ah, my Lord Arthur, what shall become of me? Now ye go from me, and leave me here alone among mine enemies. Comfort thyself, said the king, and do as well as thou mayst, for in me is no trust for to trust in. For I will into the vale of Avalon, to heal me of my grievous wound. And if thou hear never more of me, pray for my soul. But ever the queens and ladies wept and shrieked that it was pity to hear. And as soon as Sir Bedivere had lost sight of the barge, he wept and wailed, and so took the forest, and so he went all that night, and in the morning he was where, betwixt two holt's hall, of a chapel and an hermitage. Then was Sir Bedivere glad, and thither he went, and when he came into the chapel, he saw where lay an hermit, grovelling on all four, there fast by a tomb, was new graven. When the hermit saw Sir Bedivere, he knew him well, for he was but little to fore, Bishop of Canterbury, that Mordred flemmed. Sir, said Sir Bedivere, what man is there interred that ye pray so fast for? Fair son, said the hermit, I wot not verily, but by deeming. But this night at midnight here came a number of ladies, and brought hither a dead corpse, and prayed me to bury him, and here they offered an hundred tapers, and they gave me an hundred peasants. Alas, said Sir Bedivere, that was my lord King Arthur, that here lieth buried in this chapel. Then Sir Bedivere swooned, and when he awoke he prayed the hermit that he might abide with him still there, to live with fasting and prayers. For from hence will I never go, said Sir Bedivere, by my will, but all the days of my life here to pray for my lord Arthur. Ye are welcome to me, said the hermit, for I know you better than ye ween that I do. Ye are the bold Bedivere, and the full noble duke, Sir Lucan the butler, was your brother. Then Sir Bedivere told the hermit all as ye have heard to fall. So there bowed Sir Bedivere with the hermit that was to fall Bishop of Canterbury. And there Sir Bedivere put upon him poor clothes, and served the hermit full lowly, in fasting and in prayers. Thus of Arthur, I find never more written in books that be authorised, nor more of the very certainty of his death heard I never read. But thus he was led away, in a ship wherein were three queens, that one was King Arthur's sister, Queen Morgan le Fay, the other was the Queen of Northgales, the third was the Queen of the Wastelands. 
Yet some men say, in many parts of England, that King Arthur is not dead, but had by the will of our Lord Jesu into another place. And men say that he shall come again, and he shall win the Holy Cross. I will not say it shall be so, but rather I will say, here in this world he changed his life. But many men say that there is written upon his tomb this verse. Hic jacet Arturus, rex quondam, rexque futurus. Here lies Arthur, the once and future King. Here is the end of the whole book of King Arthur, and of his noble knights of the round table, that when they were whole together there was ever an hundred and forty. And here is the end of the death of Arthur. I pray you all, Gentle men and gentle women, that readeth this book of Arthur and his knights from the beginning to the ending, pray for me while I am alive, that God send me good deliverance. And when I am dead, I pray you all, pray for my soul. For this book was ended the ninth year of the reign of King Edward the Fourth, by Sir Thomas Mallory, knight, as Jesu help him for his great might, as he is the servant of Jesu, both day and night.